Thanks. Okay, so my name is Miguel Mendez. I uh, work on the Google Web Toolkit, um, and I'm here today to talk about the Google Web Toolkit and client-server communications. So the basic agenda that I thought we, should, we could cover would be just the communication infrastructure that GWT provides for you, um, and then how that's used for, how you could use that to communicate with XML-based services, JSON-based services, and then some details on GWT RPC, and then lastly, just some general best practices for all types of services that you might be designing. So first part is the communication infrastructure. And probably the first thing to talk about, um, not that just really for completeness more than anything else, are frames. So GWT actually provides a frame class as part of the user module, so it's accessible to all of your apps. Um, you can use frames to communicate with servers, uh, you know, basically by putting data into the URL, and then you can get responses, obviously, from the frame content, or the server can add additional script tags that will call back into you. Uh, this is not really, uh, I, again, I just mentioned it for completeness more than anything else, but if you do, if you did decide to build your communications using frames, you'd have to consider how that impacts history, um, which is a non-trivial issue, and also there's a load event reliability, specifically in Safari 2, where they're not as reliable, as reliably delivered, I should say. Um, another one that's worth mentioning is the uh, form panel. So basically, this is just a way to that you can actually use to communicate with your, you know, just sort of existing form-based servers. Um, data is sent asynchronously in GWT always, and our form panel implementation also has that restriction. Um, but basically, you know, you can create a form panel, you can add widgets to it, submit it, um, and all those widgets that uh, implement has name will actually have their information slurped into the form send that gets sent over to the server. Lastly, you could use this for file uploads. And then a quick example of how you would actually do file upload in GWT using the form panel. You can create a form panel. You would set the action. Um, you would have to, of course, set the encoding and the method, which for a file upload would be post and multi-part encoding. You could create your file upload widget. Um, you would set the upload widget and then add it to your root panel. And in this example, if I were to actually run it, you would actually have just a basic plain GWT app with a submit button, and um, that would allow you to basically do your file selection and submit the file to the server. Nothing too terribly fancy there. Sort of the next uh, very important infrastructure piece that you should be aware of is Request Builder. Um, request Builder is basically a class that exposes a builder pattern for creating HTTP gets and HTTP posts. And this is really, this really forms the backbone of a lot of different services that you would want to communicate with or use. Uh, again, it's asynchronous only. Since we, we really are focused on the end user experience, so even though a lot of these things would be simpler to code if they were synchronous, that invariably leads to a bad end user experience. So pretty much most communication things, actually all communication-related activities in GWT are asynchronous, and that's by design. But um, your, your users will thank you if you're willing to work through that. Um, so anyway, it's asynchronous. It's restricted by the same origin policy, so you know, whatever server served the script that is running that's trying to use the request builder, XHR, um, it must go back to that server of origin. You know, there are, there are all kinds of tricks you could try to play to defeat that, but um, I, I wouldn't advise it. I would just try to work within the context of the same origin policy. And lastly, uh, something else to be aware of is that browsers limit the number of pending requests that you can have. Most browsers, I think by default it's two. You know, as new browser versions come out, they have been slowly bumping that up, but it just means that if you decide to use the request builder, 
then you can't just go off and fire like 10 requests and assume that you know they're all going to happen simultaneously. They're not. You're going to get your first request, possibly your second one, and then the rest will be blocked waiting on those two to finish. Um, another thing to mention is that just XHR in general does not maintain order. So you could fire off you know, two requests, and the second request may come back before the first. Something else to be aware of. Um, so here's a quick uh, request builder example. Um, hopefully it's not too, too much to digest. But basically, you create a request builder object, and you tell it whether you want to do a get and what URL you want it to go back to. Um, in terms of the URL, it's almost always the base module URL, which will point back to the server of origin. And then you usually just append whatever fragment is going to actually receive the request. Um, the second part is we have a request callback. This goes back to the asynchronous nature of GWT communications. So you create this callback instance, and it basically has two things that it can do. It can deal with errors that were part of the request, things like, you know, 405s or, you know, 500s, or, you know, your server's not reachable. And the second and probably more important piece is actually a method that gets called when your response comes back from the server. Um, and usually in there, that's when you, you know, get the response text and you parse it and do something fun with it. Um, so taking a step back, you basically create a request builder. You tell it what HTTP verb you want plus a URL. You create a callback object to deal with errors and responses. And then lastly, you fire off the request. So, so that was the basic uh, infrastructure that we have. You know, you can have frames, you can do forms, and you can do XHR. So those are sort of the, the, the key building blocks that you, we have within GWT currently to do communication. So let's take a couple of quick looks, uh, a quick look at how you could do, you can communicate with XML-based services. Um, so we actually have a whole XML module in GWT, and um, it exposes several classes for dealing with XML documents. The first one is an XML parser. That literally just takes a string that contains valid XML, it parses it, and it returns to you a document object. The document object is basically a DOM-like class, and you can you know, query information about the structure of the document and traverse it and do all those things. Um, the document class also allows modification and conversion back into a string. And so, so it is possible, it is somewhat laborious currently to talk to XML services. Um, you know, so building a SOAP envelope, th types, things like that, would be laborious. You could actually create a generator to do that for you if you wanted to. And then here's just a quick example of how you could communicate with an XML-based service in RPC. Again, you would create your response callback, and in your response received, you could just get the text, pass it to the XML parser, that gives you back your document, and you can inspect it. Um, as part of your request, you can actually create a document, a brand new XML document using um, the XML parser itself. And I didn't add any code. I didn't have any examples there of how you would manipulate the document to build your envelope or encode your arguments or all that sort of thing. But I think it's reasonably clear how you would do that. And then lastly, again, you just send the request, except this time you ask the doc to convert itself into a string and you fire off the request. And that would be just sort of a baseline way to um, communicate with an XML service like XML RPC or SOAP or that sort of thing. Again, generators are, um, if you were doing this a lot, you probably would want to create a generator that would inspect some information and generate all this marshalling code for you. Um, so another area I thought we could talk about briefly, we're just communicating with JSON-based services. And it follows a pretty similar pattern to XML-based services. So again, we have a JSON module in GWT that allows you to um, create JSON objects 
inspect them and convert them to and from strings. As you would expect, the name is JSON parser, and you give it a string, and it returns this JSON root type. It's called JSON value, and that has various different subtypes for things like string, array, nulls, that sort of thing. Um, one thing I wanted to just, I'm sure we're all clear on it, but JSON is just a way to encode data. It is not a communications protocol in and of itself. Um, so it's just a way to encode non-cyclic data specifically. And then on top of that, you build additional services like JSONP, JSONRPC. Um, but again, JSON is just an encoding. And you know, JSONP is just that encoding plus a callback. Nothing too terribly fancy there. And um, again, in this case, the, laborious, the conversion is laborious and manual. But again, if you really wanted to do this, you could bring a generator to bear and make all that happen. So here's a quick example of how you would use it, how you would use the request builder and the JSON classes to build your JSON objects and send requests off. So again, you create your request builder with your verb and your URL, create a callback object. In the response, you could just get the text, convert it to a JSON value, and then you could go to town and inspect that as you, as in whatever manner you prefer. And then as far as sending the request, you know, you could literally encode your JSON string manually, as that example does, or you could have actually used the JSON classes to build one up and do that for you. So, so, so this is an interesting thing that is uh, new to GWT 1.5, and I thought it would be worthwhile mentioning because it, it really can actually improve the efficiency code size runtime RAM consumption of your apps. Um, in GWT 1.5, we added this really cool new feature where you can basically define a Java type that overlays a JavaScript object. Now, it, it's important to note that this is not like containment. This is not wrapping. This is literally a Java type that overlays a JavaScript object, and the compiler will make all that go away at compile time. So at runtime, if you look at the generated code, it'll look like you are actually directly manipulating the JavaScript object, as you would if you were writing JavaScript by hand. So I mention this because it's, it's, you can get some performance wins if you're communicating with JSON services in this manner. So in this particular example, I'm assuming that you have a, a very simple object whose representation is literally just count and a number. And the way that you would declare your Java code to interact with that would be to literally declare a class that extends JavaScript object. And then you would um, just provide accessors that reach in and grab the particular property you're interested in. Now, there's something pretty cool here that I want to make sure doesn't go by, which is the from JSON string method. Notice that that method could actually take a JSON encoded string, it evals it, and it returns a type of my JSO. There's no wrapping going on there. This is all compiler magic and overlays. If, you've, if any of you coded in C, C++, and did network programming, you'd be familiar with this technique. It's the same thing, just for Java and JavaScript. Um, so there's no wrapping. You get this JSO, and then you can get to the property. So if you look at the getCount method, it literally says this dot count. That's what's returned. That this is the underlying JavaScript object without any wrapping. So if you're communicating with JSON-based services, you don't strictly have to go back to this JSON parser and create this object hierarchy that you have to traverse. If you know the structure of that JSON, you can actually use these overlay tricks and get very, very efficient manipulation of the underlying data. Okay, so now we can talk a little bit more about GWT RPC, but just to take stock. So we talked about the basic communication infrastructure in GWT, talked about how you could use that to communicate with um, JSON-based services, XML-based services. Uh, got a little performance tip on how you could interoperate with JavaScript objects. 
So now let's talk about GWT RPC. So GWT RPC, the, the primary design or the primary goal for GWT RPC was literally to move Java instances between the client and, the, and a Java servlet. That's it. Um, it uses serializable and is serializable as marker interfaces to determine what the possible types that can be exchanged between the client and the server are. Uh, basically, you define a couple of interfaces that define your service. And then we have a generator which actually goes off, looks at that interface, computes the possible types that can be exchanged across it. Based on that computation, it then goes off and generates all the serialization and marshalling code for you. And lastly, it creates a serialization policy file. Just a quick note on serialization policy files. You don't want to bypass them. Um, their purpose is to help secure your server. When we added support for serializable, we needed to add that serialization policy to ensure that a malicious payload couldn't cause some random serializable class to be instantiated on your server. I've seen a lot of traffic on like the developer forum and GWTC where people are like, oh God, this thing is a horrible pain, I can't configure it, you know, I've got my servlet, you know, I've got the shared RPC servlet and different apps that are trying to communicate with it and I can't get it configured, I'm just going to bypass it. It's a bad idea. You don't want to do it. If you're having problems, we can talk about it on GWTC, but you really don't want to bypass it. Um, so as part of GWT 1.5, we've actually also added support for the um, Java 1.5 language constructs. So your remote services now can be generic types. They can use wildcards, parameterizations, you know, all the things that you would expect to be able to do in a Java 1.5 environment. Enumerated types, of course. Lastly, GWT RPC really isn't anything special. Like, if you're using GWT, you can take GWT RPC or you can leave it. It's not a fundamental component of GWT. It's just a a facility, we hope you find it useful, but you don't have to use it at all. You can create your own communications mechanism. You know, basically, GWT RPC is a generator that builds a bunch of code that at the end of the day just uses request builder to move data between the client and server. So, you know, if you don't like it, you can totally replace it, define your own. Um, if, if you guys uh, didn't check out the um, generator discussion yesterday or the linker discussion, um, those would be good things to go back and check out on YouTube when they're posted because it talks about some of the underpinnings that we use to build GWT RPC. But at the end of the day, you really don't have to use GWT RPC if you don't want to. It's not core to GWT. Um, there is one benefit, though, which is as we improve the code generation and encodings and, and all those things. Like the rest of GWT, you just recompile your app and you pick it up. So if you have something really, really custom you're trying to do with GWT and GWT RPC is limiting you, you can create your own. Or if you can work within its constraints, then you know we basically maintain it, we improve it, and you pick up the benefits of that. So a couple of things have changed in 1.5 with regards to declaring a remote service. They're not, it's not, you know, there's not a backwards compatibility break. It's just additional functionality. So if you're familiar with GWT RPC, you know you declare a synchronous version of the interface, which is implemented by your server, and then you declare an asynchronous version, which is used on the client. Um, if you look at the synchronous version, the task remote service up there, you'll notice this funny little annotation remote service relative path. That whole business is really about getting you out of the business of specifically having to set your service def target. And there's an example that kind of shows you the code that gets removed if you choose to use it. Another thing to note is that now, like I said, you actually can say list of some parameterized type as a return type, as an argument. Um, and of course, if you really wanted to, you could have said, you know, list of wildcard extends tasks and continue on that way. You can even actually declare 
generic methods on your remote service, you know, if you wanted to do that. Um, and again, as you would expect, in the asynchronous version, the same parameterizations are at play. So the asynchronous callback type has been generified for GWT 1.5. And now you can actually tell it specifically what type you expect to get back in the on success method. And in this case, it's just list of tasks. And I'll get into another example that talks about that. Not really much has changed in the task remote, in the servlet aspect of it other than, again, you can use parameterized types now. So that's how you would actually declare a remote service. And then we can actually spend a little bit of time talking about how you would invoke a GWT remote service now. So again, the code hasn't really changed all that much. You know, you do a GWT.create of the synchronous interface and you get this proxy object back that you can then use to make calls. What's interesting is that now, because of that annotation we added to the synchronous version, you don't have to do that funky code to cast to the addressing interface and then call set service entry point on it. And then if you look at the callback object, again, it's parameterized. So the on success now actually takes the exact type that you said it should, list of tasks. So you don't have to actually cast it from object to whatever type you want. And because we support Java 1.5 now, you can actually use the um, enhanced for each loop in Java and traverse that. So, so again, not anything too terribly fancy, just additional functionality. Your previous code will still continue to work, but if you wanted to, you could take advantage of some of these techniques. Um, so like I said, GWTRPC is built on top of Request Builder. So we actually had received several requests for providing a mechanism to do things like cancel requests. Um, and this is one of the things we put into 1.5. You can actually, so previously the, um, the methods on the asynchronous version of the interface were always specified to return void. That's no longer true. They can have non-void return types. And depending on what that type is, you can get access to some underlying infrastructure code. So for example, in this case, if you were to change the return type of the asynchronous version of get tasks to request, that actually returns the request object used by the request builder XHR code. And basically, you know, what this allows you to do is it allows you to then, in the client, you can issue a request. It will return back to you the request object. And if you want, you can cancel the HTTP part of the request. This request cancellation isn't really about trying to cancel the remote service servlet processing. It really is just about the transport layer. But you can do it. Wit 1.5. Um, there's also there's also a slightly more advanced use case that people have been interested in, which is the one where you know they want to add headers to the request, they want to inspect headers on the result coming back. So we took this we took a similar approach, and now you can change the return type of the async method to be a request builder. And that basically allows you then to get back a fully configured request where all you have to do is turn the crank. Now, which, is, which would be done via requestbuilder.send. Now, that gives you the opportunity to do things like, you know, configure your request timeouts. If you wanted to do an RPC with a timeout, you could do that now. Um, if you wanted to add headers to the request, you could do that now. And um, if you're willing to, you could even intercept the result processing and look at the headers on the result object of that request. So basically, you can change the return types on your asynchronous methods, and you can get access to the underlying request or request builder objects that RPC uses. So you could build additional functionality in that way. You know, you could even have a... Um, you could even actually wrap this modified async interface in a regular one 
that has a void return type, and then you could do all kinds of special handling in there and reuse the code. So that's another interesting feature that we put in to quit RPC for 1.5. There's also um, a couple of other cases that people have wanted to do for, for a variety of different reasons, which is they want to actually use RPC serialization, but they don't want to use the RPC transport per se. So, you know, maybe you want, you like the fact that the RPC can take your objects, convert them into a string, but maybe you don't want to just send those through the built-in XHR. Maybe you want to, I don't know, aggregate them into some other type of payload that you're building specifically for your app. So you can actually do that. Um, for GWT 1.5, we basically exposed a way to get access to the underlying serialization that GWT provides. Um, you know, usually you would use this. You could use this technique for pre-serializing responses. So, for example, if you know your application always starts up, makes an RPC request to the server, gets some payload, and then process it, you can actually short circuit that process now and get rid of one request. On the server, when the information is requested, you could actually take the objects that you would have sent back normally, pre-serialize them into the outer page, and then the client can actually grab that information and using this technique, deserialize the response. So you would short circuit one RPC request. Um, so the client would actually use a code very similar to this to do that, and then the server could use the encode response for success method on the RPC class. Quick thing to point out, the serialization streams for GWT RPC are not symmetric. They're not encoded the same way. Coming down to the client, it's a, it's a JSON-like encoding. Going up to the server, it's a delimited encoding. Our experience was that at the time it made sense for, from a performance standpoint to do that. Um, you know, that may change in the future, but I do want to point out that if you if you do start to tap into this technique, you can't create a stream on the client and read it back on the client, but you can create a stream on the client, read it back on the server, and vice versa. So looking at this code then, you would still gwit.create your synchronous interface, but um, you would what you actually get back, in the proxy actually implements this factory for you now. So you can actually just gwit.create your service. You get this factory back. With that factory, you can create a stream reader for a particular server payload, and then you can literally just call read object and get the deserialized graph. So you're using RPC serialization completely outside of the RPC mechanism. Um, then lastly, just a couple of general um, best practices that you should consider when you're designing services. Obviously, stateless servers are better. They're better for scalability, failover, all those types of things. Um, keep the conversation state in the client. We've got a lot of powerful techniques for caching information down there, and you should use them. Um, when you're considering your service also consider how it will fail and how it will impact the user. If you're building something like Writely and something fails, what's that user going to do with that half-written document? So consider that. Lastly, you know, at least with regards to GWT RPC, it allows you to send back really, really large object graphs. And generally speaking, that's not, that's not really what you want to do. So Almost always what you really want to do is actually have some type of return which is paginated. So, you know, you send 10 records, 100 records, and you just sort of incrementally send them down that way instead of sending 10,000 records to the client. Um, another thing that's worthwhile pointing out is that, um, at least specifically with regards to GWT RPC, when you're defining your remote service interface, Remember that RPC is a speculative beast 
So if you have if you have Java IO serializable as a return type, it is going to try to handle every single possible thing that could be assigned to that type, which is usually a lot more than you want. It'll bloat your client side your client side code, and really. What you want to do is always use the most specific type that you can, and that'll guarantee that you get the tightest client-side serialization code possible. Um, okay, so that's it. I have time, a fair amount of time, actually, for QA. Um, there are mics on in the center aisle and over here on the left-hand side. And, uh, Um, I wanted to mention that uh, I'm on the GWT team, too. I'm doing a talk about overlay types at 2 p.m. today, and we're going to go in more depth about the efficient um, JavaScript overlay types that Miguel mentioned. Um, the other thing is I, I, I think um, that last point about um, RPC being speculative and declaring types serializable and why that could lead to bloat is a subtle point, and it might be worth um, talking about that just a tiny bit more and how you know, polymorphism influences the sure. amount of deserialization code. Sure. So um, RPC actually goes off and tries to figure out these type graphs based on your declaration. So, you know, if you were to use serializable in your RPC interface explicitly, then anything, because of polymorphism, anything that could be assigned to serializable could be a possible type in that location. So things like, so if you had serializable, you would pick up string, number, and all of its subtypes. You would pick up uh, array list, vector, hash map, hash set, uh, linked tree map, uh, you know, all these things. So you have to be really careful about how you design your remote service interface because the higher up the inheritance hierarchy you go, the more stuff you're obviously going to pick up downstream. And that's transitive. So if you pick up one type that's assignable to serializable, you will also pick up all the types that it references transitively. So it, it can be a fairly expensive proposition if you're not careful. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have a question about sure. uh, the request builder. Uh, if I understood correctly, uh, with the tasks, you can define a set of, like, let's say, five requests asynchronous, and you would um, execute them all at once. Uh, they will come back in a random order. But I'm more particular, particularly interested in how you can create a loop of uh, asynchronous requests. Let's say you want the same uh, request be executed ten times. And uh, so that the, uh, before executing the next request, you wait for the previous response. So you want them to be executed in order. Okay. How do you do that? You would use a, a state, a stateful callback object. So uh, one pattern you can do is when you declare your asynchronous callback instance, in the on success, you could actually process the result and then fire off the next request. So they're basically chained. The first request completes, and then as part of processing that, you fire off the next request, and it continues that way. So you don't fire them all off at the same time. You basically chain them. And that's the way you could guarantee the order. Um, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is... Um, uh, about input sanitization, um, you talked, uh, or you mentioned the serialization policy file, um, and I'm wondering what sort of sanitization, if there's any that happens on those evals. Um, and the other question is, um, if you're doing a web application, you're expecting a lot of users, and you're trying to really minimize um, bandwidth um, and network traffic going back and forth, um, how much overhead is there, would you say, sort of subjectively in the um, built-in RPC versus going out and designing, like, say, your own protocol? Okay, so, th so then the first question was sanitization. What does RPC do to sanitize? You mean like sanitize like input or just sanitize the types coming in? Yeah, the input. Say somebody tried to inject um, some code into your page um, by intercepting your request or something like that. 
There, it, it does do um, some. It does have some cross-site protection for one. Two, all these types have strongly um, strong signatures associated with them. So I didn't go into that, but the RPC payload is actually um, there's actually a signature that is built, which um, relates to the type layout. So you can't like change the definition of a type on the fly against it, it would actually detect that and okay, present so it. it. So if you try to send a string where it's expecting an integer, it's not going to go for right. it. Okay. Right. Um, and then your second question was, I'm sorry. Um, overhead. Overhead. I mean, I think it's fairly minimal overhead, personally. I mean, the code is fairly tight in the way that it um, actually serializes and deserializes. That's part of the asymmetric nature of it. Um, so I, I subjectively, I don't think there's very much overhead. And if you were to try to write that code yourself, you would actually have to write it, maintain it, test it. So there's additional costs there to consider. Compared to JSON, for example, which is what most people might use instead of RPC, how does it compare on the wire to JSON? Well, I mean, it, it's JSON coming back from the server. Mm -hmm. So literally, when the client gets a response, it evals it and then just decodes it. But it's basically JSON encoding coming back from the server. Thanks. Actually, I was trying to prompt you to say that it's a lot less verbose than JSON. In fact, I mean, in JSON, for every customer record, you've got a field that's called first name and then, you know, the name, right, the right. data. The next record has the word first name and then the value. RPC factors all that out in the wire format. So technically it's JSON, but if you actually look at it, there's none of this redundant metadata. So... I, I, I'm a little less, um, I'm a little more willing to like go out on a limb. I think it's a lot more efficient than using JSON, at least in sure. terms of the bytes on the wire. Yeah, I mean, if you if you actually look at the payload, it literally is just an array of strings followed by an array of numbers. So there are no property names in there, none of that. So it's it's really quite minimal. And Bruce is correct. It does not. It's not like your traditional JSON encoded where you have property name, colon, value. It literally is just a string of, uh, an array of strings followed by an array of numbers. And it automatically factors out duplicate objects and, That's right. and in turn strings so that you're not sending redundant strings across different objects and things like that. So I think you're underselling it. You did a great job with it. <laughs> I, I tend to undersell. I, bet. I, I have to say one more thing. I, I totally forgot to mention the JavaScript overlay types talk. It's called surprisingly rockin' DOM and JavaScript programming, and it's gotten bounced around like three times. Um, my name is Bruce Johnson. It's at 2 p.m. today. Yep. It's not what's reflected on your session calendar. Yep. I don't know how you'll find what room it is. It's, <laughs> it's room nine. Room nine? Room nine. Okay. According right, to this. I'll shut up. Thank you. Uh, on your uh, slide that we were talking about, uh, using JSON to communicate back and forth with your server, uh, one of the things that you showed was um, you can just evaluate a string using the eval function that's built into JavaScript. Was that something that you just used for expediency on the slide, or is that the recommended way to do it? Because if you're communicating with uh, an, a foreign site using JSON, then that seems like you really have to trust the people that run that site to make sure they don't have some function evaluation in the JSON that they send back. I mean, if, if you're using JSON, you... Well, first of all, you have the same origin policy to consider, right? So well, except that you were, it looked like it was sort of a general purpose tool. You've got JSON parser, and you can just say, you know, here's a string and eval this and whatever. So I just, if you're using uh, injected script tags or whatever to communicate with foreign servers, then um, does it, is there a parser built into GWT? Like, I mean, I'm using it. I just haven't used J JSON. I mean, so. Uh, so it, it, do you just recommend that you use eval and trust the people you're getting JSON from, or is there a, a tool written that goes and parses the tree to, to make sure that you don't evaluate functions? So even even the JSON parser does eval. Okay. Right. I mean, that's if, if you're going to deal in the world of JSON, then you're going to have to rely on eval to get performance out of it. And if you're going to do that, you have to trust your server. If you don't, then you need to consider other techniques. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Can you use... Um, with RPC with um, non-Java backends, the way, kind of the way you mentioned with the uh, overriding the request builder. Mechanism. I mean, I guess you, I guess you could. It's kind of hard for me to envision, though, like how you would overlay a Java type 
onto something, onto some non-Java type system. I think to me that's kind of the issue. And you could do it, but you would have to build that up yourself. Okay. I mean, you, you kind of said that the way the request goes out, it's just parameters, encoded parameters, right? In, in RPC, right? You mean the encoding? The, the outbound the, the outbound request is just encoded parameters. Is, isn't that what you said? Right, but that those parameters, uh, the, the encoding actually makes an assumption that Java types are involved okay. and that the server knows how to pick that stream apart and reconstitute the types. And so one of the primary design goals for GUID RPC was to communicate with a Java servlet. So if it's not communicating with a Java servlet, then some of the fundamental assumptions would need to be met somehow. Does that make sense? Yeah. So probably in your server, you would have to do something like pick apart the stream and then convert whatever the client thought those types should be into whatever makes sense for your server. Okay. Thank you. In the case where you have multiple pages in your application, and if you're keeping the state on the client, what are your recommended techniques for passing that state information from one page to the next? What approaches do you suggest? Well, um, so if you're using GWT, actually it could probably all be one page, mm -hmm. and the multi-pages could be simulated. If it's separate pages, um, I'm not sure what the best technique would be there, to be honest, because those pages are isolated from one another. So, well, a way to do it would be if you had gears, for example, you could store that information in the database, and then all the pages could access it. Okay. But I actually don't, um, I don't have sort of the best practice answer for that. But if you want, we can go offline afterwards. And I can so it sounds like for, a, for the state on the client, the general pattern is to just implement that all in one page, basically. That's definitely a way to do it. Okay. Thanks. It would avoid the additional page reloads, too, which is another benefit. Okay, if my application has multiple sections and each section requires an update from the server, so it's like a server puts, uh, pushing the real-time data to the client, what's the best approach to uh, implement it? I'm sorry, your question was how to have the client? How to have the server push the data to the client? In, uh, okay, yeah. uh -huh. so there's a, there's a couple of, co I mean, there, there are a couple of techniques for making that happen. Um, you know, just generally, it's called a hanging get. So you basically make a request to the server. The servlet sits on that request until it has information to send back. And when it does, it sends it back. There, there are issues with that technique. Um, like, for example, if your servlet container doesn't have good built-in support for that, it can actually mm -hmm. be there's actually significant cost with keeping that HTTP request open. And in servers like Tomcat, for example, I believe it creates a new thread per request, which has additional constraints on the operating system. So you can make that technique work well if you have very low, uh, usability, use, uh, very low number of clients. But as you, try, as you try to scale the number of clients up, that technique will not hold unless you have something like Jetty with continuations where they actually have special mechanisms for making that go. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I've been uh, experiment, experimenting with a GWT wrapper for Gears. Yes. And something that I think would be kind of cool is doing RPC in a worker pool. And right now the worker pool kind of requires you to inject like some native JavaScript. So I wondered if it would be possible to use this idea of the JavaScript object to kind of do RPC within a worker pool in GWT? I don't know if there's... Well, I mean, I think that, that like, so like my favorite, sorry, my favorite uh, technique for having a worker communicate with its parent, like based on the latest JavaScript object techniques that we have, would actually be to pass that as a string between the, between the worker and the parent, because then they could actually have very efficient communication between themselves. Now, when you were saying RPC, were you saying actually have the worker make an RPC request back to a server? Yeah, that's right. That is technically, that is theoretically possible, mm -hmm. but you would have to do some of that work yourself. Like you'd probably have to um, create a single script output worker 
for one. You'd have to figure out how you tell it what URL it needs to go to because it doesn't it doesn't have access to any DOM methods. If, if you're in a worker, you don't have access to any of the DOM methods, so you can't figure out what your base module URL is. But if you could tell it, then you could actually use that, the single script output linker, and you would have to actually make one change to the rebind rules for request builder. But in theory, you could actually make that go. Any other questions? Would you mind stepping to the mic so we can? The, uh, the J2E emulation that GWT has, did that change at all from 1.4 to 1.5 except for the support for um, long? Were there any additional, additional Java strong types? types that were added? We added more collection types. I know that. Um, I think there, I actually don't know exactly the set of types, but we did actually um, add some more collection types and we generified them. But if you wanted to actually find out exactly what types we added, it probably would just be best to go back to the Java doc and check it out. Just wanted to add to that. I, I was reading the news group this morning and apparently they have um, Java.sql types for date, dates and times. I think is has just been committed or is in code review, and uh, the collection types that have been added are things like uh, linked hash map and tree map and the sets related to them. I think, um, but I mean, it's if you search through the uh, the developer forum for code reviews for things for the things that you're looking for, the stuff that's relevant to you, you probably find a conversation about whether or not it's in. Thank you. Have you added string tokenizer? String tokenizer? Yeah. No. I don't believe so. Because that seems like a pretty simple class that could have been added. I have to keep writing it myself. <laughs> well, hey, you know, we're, we're open source, so definitely, if you're inclined, <laughs> send us a patch. We'd love to have it. Seriously. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Just a quick clarification. Uh, RPC objects, they still need the is serializable marker. You, you were talking earlier. You and okay. Bruce were having a there's, conversation there's about There's two marker interfaces. Right. There's the Java IO serializable. Right. right. And then there is the is serializable. You can use either one. They're still required. Yeah, one yeah. of those two. Okay. Any other questions? Any? Nope. Oh. Okay, this one isn't uh, RP RPC related, but uh, uh, in the past, before there was the JavaScript object overlays, uh, Implement with the uh, 1.5 release. There were a lot of people uh, wrapping some really popular effects libraries, such as Scriptaculous and others. Um, from from your guys' perspective, uh, are you guys looking into maybe packaging that with some next releases? Uh, you know, so that people aren't just reinventing the uh, the overlay implementation of of uh, uh, I guess working with those effects. Libraries. So we added the capability to declare overlays and use them, but you know you could use that technique for wrapping whatever library you wish, and you know actually create it as a project, open source project, and redistribute it. So, I mean, if it made sense for us to include it, that's a separate question, I think. But there's nothing um, that a user has to do in terms of like GWT compiler magic to make those overlays work. They just we just added that capability, and you can use it okay. in the best way you think. Uh, I have one question. Uh, why are you using like, the serialize for RPC instead of XML RPC? Well, um, XML is pretty, pretty verbose, actually. So, you know, you have your opening tag, you have your closing tag, you have attributes, it's hierarchical. Um, so, I mean, I think there's cases where it makes sense. But for what we were trying to do to make something that was, you know, very, very thin on the wire, fast to encode, fast to decode, it didn't seem like the best choice. Hey, I noticed that there's not a class in these two days on how to use GWT with uh, Python App Engine. And from a lot of the serializable stuff you're talking about, it sounds like it might be trickier than it kind of ought to be. And I just wondered, like, do you guys have plans on making those two worlds work together better, or what are the best practices for doing that? So, I mean, I think that 
it's definitely, you could definitely imagine that we want to make that work better. Um, I don't have a time frame for you on when that would happen, but um, I mean, you could obviously, you could obviously do, you could obviously make that communication happen with the infrastructure pieces we have today. As far as codifying that into a, a system with best practices and all that, that hasn't happened yet. I could definitely imagine that we will do that. I just don't know when that would be. Hi. Um, you mentioned exposing the request builder on the client side so that you could tweak headers for going from the GWT client to the server in RPC. Is there a way that you can manipulate the headers going the other way? Set from caching headers, et cetera, from et cetera. From the server? From the server, yeah. Um, well, you actually can. Like the the main the, the bulk of the RPC magic of on the server is actually handled by one class. It's the RPC class. The fact that we have our own remote service servlet that wraps it is just an implementation detail. So you could do you could actually create your own servlet that does whatever special handling it wants. Um, also, you should be able to override the, I think it's the process call method, and still get access to, from it to whatever, well, actually, I'm sorry. The easiest way to do it is in whatever method you want to modify it, you can actually ask the remote service servlet for the current re response object. So there's a couple different ways you could do it. Any other questions? No? All right. Well, if there's no more questions, I uh, appreciate your time and thank you for coming.